Welcome, um, everyone, for coming to the uh, uh, India and China at Sea Conference, Competition and Coexistence in the Indo-Pacific Maritime Domain. We've got a, um, uh, a full program today and some fantastic speakers um, uh, from uh, 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 some of them from a long way away, and I'll introduce them uh, later, a little bit later. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders of the Nunnawal people, past and present. So, again, thank you uh, for coming. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, both the Australia India Institute and the National Security College for their support in holding this event. And as I'll mention later, this is a, a project that's been uh, developing for two years with the generous financial assistance of the uh, John D. and Catherine T. Uh, MacArthur Foundation. Uh, so, first, first of all, I'd like to uh, introduce. Uh, Professor Craig Jeffrey, who's the Director and CEO of the Australia India Institute, um, to say a few words um, about the Australia India Institute uh, and, uh, just to uh, start this project off. Thanks. As you can probably hear, I'm a, a Brit, but uh, have been in Australia now for a year and intend to stay here. I love uh, the country and uh, my adopted home, Melbourne. Uh, I play the role of, be, of leading the Australia-India Institute, which is primarily based in Melbourne. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about it uh, because I'm aware that not all of you in the room will uh, know about the Institute and its activity, but also because I think there's quite a lot of connections between the commitments of the Institute and some of the commitments that underpin uh, discussions today. So the Institute was established in 2008 uh, with a grant from the Commonwealth Government. We're now funded by a series of universities across Australia, particularly the University of Melbourne and the Commonwealth Government and the Victoria State Government. Our mandate is to improve relationships between Australia and India through sponsoring research, engaging with government and business, and through various forms of public outreach. We're in a stage at the moment of upscaling, which is very exciting, so we're having a lot of appointments to the Institute. One of the things I draw your attention to, and uh, in conversations outside of formal proceedings, I'd be very interested in hearing people's views on how this uh, enterprise can work. We have 10 so-called new generation network scholars starting at a range of Australian universities and in various cities across the country over the next six months. And this is a group of uh, they're three-year postdoctoral researchers who are going to be studying different aspects of con contemporary India, including security, but what ranged across a wide uh, portfolio of interests. So we've got someone start working on smart cities, smart infrastructure, public health, sport government, security, social science. This is a really exciting experiment in revitalizing South Asia-related work in Australia in a context where I think it's fair to say that Indian studies is not as strong now as it was in the 1980s. Certainly, if you're an undergraduate student wanting to learn about India, there aren't the same opportunities that there were uh, e even 25 years ago. I think my reason for being excited about today, and David, your uh, conference, uh, uh, and I know that comes out of collaborative work with Rory and my predecessor, Amitav Mathu, is that it, it, it provides in miniature uh, a nice example of some of the commitments that underpin our work at the AII. First of all, and this will be very obvious to many of you who work in IR, but forgive me as an anthropologist coming into this uh, arena, the, the commitment to comparison, and the commitment to, not just to comparing A and B, but also uh, what I would term connective comparison, thinking about how changes in A affect changes in B. And it strikes me that that type of lateral imagination is increasingly important in the contemporary moment, obviously, but also an important component to, to bring into our teaching in a context where we're often telling students to you know, go deep, investigate in depth, to think linearly in relation to particular countries. Certainly that's part of my teaching commitment as a, as a geographer and anthropologist. But less often are we interested actually in lateral connections and, and challenging students to think about uh, how 
for example, changes in, in public policy in India might affect changes in public policy in Australia or China. A second aspect of today's conference that I think is really ex exciting is its interdisciplinary nature. And I think it's important to, to continue to think about how different disciplines can contribute to the conversation about security, and also to actually definitions of what security itself might entail, both with a uh, you know, security with a capital S and security with a, a small s. And I was talking to Rory about this this morning, and one thing that I think is really important and interesting about National Security College is its commitment to thinking about security in quite Catholic and ecumenical ways. And the third uh, reason why I'm excited today, again, this will be obvious to many in the room, uh, is the capacity, uh, the, the potential it provides for opening up a whole range of conversations between people in academia and in various other sectors. And one of the privileges of working as director of the AI is I meet a series of people who, to my mind, model very nicely what it is to be a public intellectual in the contemporary world. People who are amphibious, move across government, academia. Uh, the, the, the metaphor doesn't work because amphibious only implies two things, but I'm actually thinking about people who move across <laughs> multiple spheres between government, academia, uh, business, and other areas. So I'm tremendously excited about today's program. I hope I'll get an opportunity to, to talk to you, uh, some of you on the, the sidelines as well. Do remember the Australia India Institute. We're open for business. Look at our website. We have great events almost every two days, not just in Melbourne, but in other uh, national centres. So thank you very much, and uh, I hope the conference goes very well. Look forward to proceedings. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, then, uh, now if I could ask uh, the head of the National Security College, uh, Rory Medcalf, to give a bit of an introduction to not only the project but some words of, about how it, it sits with the evolving concept of the Indo-Pacific. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, David, and it's also uh, a great uh, pleasure to welcome uh, Craig Jeffrey as our collaborator on this project. Welcome to you all. Um, I might say to begin with that I'm really uh, struck and impressed by the, uh, the breadth and the scale of the turnout uh, and the quality of the turnout for today's event. Just looking around the room, so many familiar faces, uh, colleagues from academia, government, uh, the policy community uh, in Australia and internationally, including our international delegates uh, and perspectives from uh, India, China and elsewhere uh, are especially welcome today. So I want to say a few more words of welcome, I guess, from the perspective of the National Security College, uh, uh, where, where we sit at the moment, and also uh, from a personal perspective about this project, a few words about this project, and then I'd like to introduce a few of the questions that will frame our day of discussions, uh, questions that will be familiar to many of you, but questions that are probably not asked often enough about the changing power balance in our region, what it means for all countries in the Indo-Pacific, but of course, um, from an Australian perspective in particular. So I guess the, um, the, the quality of the turnout and the scale of the turnout at this, uh, this small conference today uh, shows that there is serious interest in questions about the future balance of power in our region going beyond, uh, I guess, the, uh, the often narrowly conceived Bi bilateral or bipolar situation of uh, the United States and China. And of course, on a day like today, when a few of you no doubt will be looking, uh, looking at screens somewhere along the line around noon today to watch uh, what should be a, a truly fascinating presidential debate uh, in the United States, I think it's worth remembering that there are more countries that matter uh, in Australia's constellation uh, of power relationships in the world other than the United States and indeed China. Now, of course, China is one of the two countries we're speaking about today on India and China at sea. Uh, but there's a really interesting context for this. Uh, and you'll see, for example, as well as the, uh, the, the splendid banners of the National Security College and the Australia India Institute, uh, a banner from a research project that the National Security College has been uh, holding uh, in, a range, uh, in, in a range of directions in recent years about understanding the Indo-Pacific regional context for Australia's security. We held um, uh, a number of other conferences earlier this year, including one, I think, in around, around March, uh, where a few of our speakers were also present, uh, looking in particular at a, at a multipolar Indo-Pacific, uh, not only at the roles of China and India, uh, but also of Indonesia, of Japan, uh, a strong uh, Japanese dimension to that 
a particular conference which we held with partnership from the Japanese embassy, but also uh, other powers, Singapore, Malaysia, uh, you know, the list goes on, the Republic of Korea, which has also deep engagement across this region. I think the, the, the key point being that for Australia, our security future, as with our economic future, is going to be moored in a set of relationships among multiple powers where, where sheer scale in terms of GDP or military power at any given time is not going to be the only measure, uh, the only measure of relative influence. But of course, when it comes to India and China, the two countries that we're looking at today and studying today, scale is indeed uh, a big part of the reason for us seeking to understand the changing dynamics of how they will engage with each other as their interests expand, as they continue to grow as trading and investment powers in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, and indeed as the military dimension of their behaviour and the security dim dimension of their behaviour across this super region uh, continues to become more and more evident. Uh, it's quite striking for me, as someone who's worked as an Australian analyst in this space uh, for many years, to watch a few of the I guess the historic moments over the past 10 years where we've seen both China and India become much more present as security powers in this maritime region uh, that is Australia's region. So, for example, the fact that uh, in 2008, when both India and China uh, in pretty quick succession became very active in counter piracy activities uh, in the Gulf of Aden or in the in Indian Ocean around the Gulf of Aden, uh, naval deployments that have continued to this day. Uh, the fact that uh, China uh, and India and many other countries in the region now have what is beginning to approach a permanent naval presence, a permanent military presence, uh, essentially at, at the edge of at the edge of Africa. Uh, in China's case, uh, a, a naval presence in the Indian Ocean for the first time in 600 years. The interesting, uh, intriguing range of um, deployments, patrols and exercises that the Chinese Navy has conducted in the Indian Ocean in recent years, including with multiple classes of submarines, including with um, surface action groups that have operated or conducted exercises in the vicinity of Australia's Indian Ocean territories, uh, a really big change in the way we understand our region. And the fact that um, India, as well as China, have emerged uh, as competitors to one another, but also as potential partners in the provision of public goods in maritime and international security. Whether it's counter piracy, whether it's developing some kind of shared operating picture of these sea lanes where our energy interests, where our trade interests, where our economic interests uh, all become so intermeshed. Uh, I think it means that the questions that are being asked in the conference today are absolutely timely. Now, uh, for researchers in this room who've worked in this space for a number of years, and I note, for example, I think uh, Lee, Lee Cordner uh, entered the room e early on, uh, and I rec recall attending a conference that you convened um, on a topic that foreshadowed this, I think, seven or eight or nine years ago. Um, so these aren't new questions, but they're becoming much more pressing. Um, how will China and India engage with one another as two of the three largest economies, as two of the three uh, most substantial military powers this century in a increasingly and increasingly shared maritime region that is close to Australia's region of interest. Uh, now, when David and I and others uh, began this research project that David has led a number of years ago uh, with support from the MacArthur Foundation as part of its wider support of Asian security research, we developed a framework, I guess, uh, based on some earlier research uh, that I was involved in looking at a continuum of uh, everything from conflict at one end of the spectrum all the way through to cooperation at the other. And of course, if you read all of the official public <coughs> diplomatic documents of various countries, cooperation is always what they talk about. But in fact, true cooperation based on strategic trust is really, really hard. Uh, and there's often quite an absence of it in the uh, relationship between India and China, including for some very understandable historic reasons. These are countries, after all, that, uh, that have fought a land war within uh, the lifetimes of much of their populations. Uh, Nuclear-armed neighbours, uh, the Pakistan issue obviously adds a whole lot of complexity to the India-China relationship. There is a pretty substantial degree of mistrust. So cooperation at one, I think, rather idealised end of the spectrum, conflict at the other. But what we're really interested, I think, in studying today is what lies in between. Uh, 
how do these countries manage strategic competition? How will that affect the interests of others, uh, whether it's of uh, smaller countries such as Australia, whether it's of the, uh, the great powers of the region and the world? How will the interests of the United States be affected, uh, Japan uh, and, and others, uh, Ind Indonesia and others? So really, I would suggest um, where we can, we try to understand today what coexistence looks like in the India-China relationship, um, how perhaps those countries can uh, get to a degree of predictability or stability beyond coexistence in the interests uh, of all countries in the region, um, what mutual respect looks like in that relationship, and I stress the, the mutual nature of that, it has to be, it has to be mutual, uh, and what competition looks like, what strategic competition looks like is purely in a military dimension? Does it have other dimensions that we need to study? Again, how will it wrap up the interests of other countries? And how perhaps do we try to shift the spectrum towards perhaps somewhere between coexistence and cooperation, but in ways that respect the sovereignty and interests uh, of other countries in the region? And of course, uh, avoiding the sea at the other end of the, um, of the spectrum conflict between two major maritime powers that are going to be increasingly active and present in our region. So look, I'll leave my opening remarks there, I think, um, just to emphasise that um, we are working on the record today, um, as I think David will reinforce a few times throughout the day. So please be as frank and open as you can in your questions, uh, but you are being recorded for the research interests of a, a much wider group of viewers. So I'll introduce David Brewster, who, uh, as well as being the convener of this research project, is a senior research fellow here at the National Security College, um, also wears a number of hats uh, in the, the research space in Australia, including, I think, as a fellow at the Australia India Institute. Um, I've known David for quite a few years now as really one of Australia's leading thinkers and researchers on the strategic implications of the rise of India. Uh, I think David's and my research interests uh, overlap. Um, we agree on most things, although I'm sure we'll find a few things that we, we disagree on throughout the day. Uh, but David's books, particularly on India as an Indian Ocean power and India as an Asia-Pacific power, should be compulsory reading uh, for anyone studying uh, the strategic dynamics of the Indo-Pacific. And it's a real pleasure to welcome David as our first speaker. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rory. So before I dive into talking about aspects of the India-China maritime security relationship, I'll just say a few words about this project and our fellow speakers today. This conference is the outcome of a two-year project uh, of the Australia-India in Institute with the generous support of the MacArthur Foundation. Um, the project involved a series of seminars with senior policy makers and analysts in India, China, the United States, uh, Singapore, Japan and Australia over a period of two years. And it's really about what I see as one of the key security challenges uh, faced by uh, the Indo-Pacific region in coming years. Indeed, this challenge is a function of the Indo-Pacific itself, and that is the growing interactions between East Asia and the Indian Ocean two regions that have historically operated fairly separately. But as we know, this is now changing with the near simultaneous rise of China and India as major economic and military powers. And increasingly, we in Australia, uh, as Rory mentioned, are going to have to increasingly uh, pay a lot more attention, not just to the uh, impact of the rising rise of China on East Asia or on the China-US relationship, but also on the China-India relationship. China and India are fast emerging as major maritime powers in the Indo-Pacific. And as their uh, interests expand, uh, they are increasingly coming into contact in the maritime domain. So, this project has essentially sought to better understand uh, and articulate Indian and Chinese strategic thinking about each other in the maritime domain. And of course, the dynamics of this relationship are changing very fast, and in fact, it's very difficult to keep up with developments. But nevertheless, there are key uh, underlying elements in their strategic perceptions over the long term. So today, uh, I'm pleased to say that we've been able to bring together some key thinkers and analysts to discuss these issues. 
Uh, later this morning, we'll hear uh, from Professor Yo Ji from the University of Macau, who uh, many would regard as one of the leading analysts on the evolution of uh, Chinese naval thinking, not only in the near seas, but right across the whole Indo-Pacific. And that's really, I think, a piece that has been missing from a lot of discussion about Chinese naval thinking. And in fact, his exposition of Chinese thinking about the Indo-Pacific is probably the best articulation uh, on that subject I, I have seen. After lunch, we'll be hearing from Pramit Pal Chowdhury, who is foreign editor of the Hindustan Times, uh, one of uh, India's leading newspapers. And Pramit exemplifies the sort of foreign affairs journalist uh, that India produces so well, and perhaps we in Australia could do with more of. But he's certainly a journalist that works close to the heart of Indian thinking on foreign affairs. And I'd like to acknowledge his uh, flight from hell yesterday to, uh, to join us. Uh, he spent uh, most of the day sitting in Melbourne Airport, and uh, I think his bag is still, uh, still sitting there. So he'll be talking about uh, changing perspectives of recent Indian governments about how to engage with China and deal with uh, the challenges that India sees from the rise of China in the Indian Ocean region. And uh, I think Pramit will cut through much of the noise that we hear about this and give us a very clear picture of the views from South Bloc. Now, later this afternoon, we'll be hearing from two excellent Indian maritime uh, security specialists on different aspects of Indian naval uh, strategy in the Indian Ocean, which have a very important impact both on the India-China relationship, but also very importantly uh, for Australia itself. Uh, first, uh, Abhijit Singh, a former Indian naval officer and now with the Observer Research Foundation, will talk about Indian perceptions of recent developments in the South China Sea and how those disputes uh, potentially impact India's interest in the Indian Ocean. And this is really a key example of the strategic interconnectedness of those two theatres that we try and encapsulate in this idea of the Indo-Pacific. And secondly, we have Dashana Barua from, the, from Carnegie India to discuss Indian thinking about maritime domain awareness and the need to develop Indian capabilities right across the Indian Ocean. And uh, in my view, this issue or this area will increasingly become a central part of India-Australia and uh, India-US defence cooperation in the Indian Ocean. So it's an important subject that we need to be talking about and thinking about here in Australia a lot more. So let me talk to, uh, now turn to my own uh, presentation, which is really intended to provide an ideational backdrop to Sino-Indian maritime security relations in the Indian Ocean. And my talk today is subtitled, A Contest of Status and Legitimacy, which uh, is intended to bring out the key elements of the security relationship in the Indian Ocean region. And that is, the very, very different perceptions of their own and each other's status and legitimacy in the region. It's, and I should stress, it's not about objective questions of status or legitimacy, it's about perceptions of status and legitimacy. And these are really major factors driving um, strategic behaviour. So the starting point is that the Sino-Indian security relationship is quite difficult in many respects. It's relatively volatile and has uh, a number of unresolved issues uh, uh, between the two countries. There's the baggage from the 1962 war, which is still really quite deeply felt um, in India. The ongoing border dispute in the Himalayas China's alliance with Pakistan, which has included the proliferation of nuclear weapons and missiles, and China's growing relationships elsewhere in South Asia. Not least is China's growing presence in the Indian Ocean, where it is perceived in Delhi to be shaping the strategic environment in its favour and forming alignments that could ultimately be used against India. 
As I mentioned today, I will focus on one aspect of the relationship, and that is how uh, fundamental differences in Chinese views on status and legitimacy of their roles in the Indian Ocean could exacerbate an already uh, competitive security dynamic in the maritime domain. So first I'll talk about China's uh, strategic imperatives in the Indian Ocean and then talk about India's aspirations towards taking an, a leading role in the Indian Ocean and its perspectives on China's presence in the region. Third, China's perspectives on India and its role in the Indian Ocean. Uh, and in conclusion, in my view, uh, Beijing will find it increasingly difficult to create a favourable strategic uh, environment in the Indian Ocean for itself in opposition to India. Nevertheless, there is little sign that Beijing is prepared to do what it takes to co-opt India as a partner in the Indian Ocean region. So China's primary strategic imperative in the Indian Ocean is the protection of its sea lanes of communication or SLOCs across the Indian Ocean, particularly those that carry the great majority of China's energy imports. Now, Beijing is keenly aware that its SLOCs are highly vulnerable to threats from both state and non-state actors, especially in the narrow choke points in the Indian Ocean through which trade mu must pass, and those include uh, the Strait of Hormuz at the entrance of the Persian Gulf and the Strait of Malacca uh, in Southeast Asia. Now, Chinese strategists are concerned that an adversary may use these vulnerabilities as a bargaining chip in the context of a wider dispute. Now, China also has a number of other developing interests in the region, including, including a growing population of Chinese nationals and big investments. And uh, these other issues, the, the non-strictly uh, maritime issues, if you like, are becoming increasingly important in Beijing's strategic thinking about the Indian Ocean. At the same time, China's military expansion program will significantly enhance its ability to project power into the Indian Ocean in the long term. Its capabilities already exceed those of India's by a considerable margin. China's naval presence has grown in connection with anti-piracy deployments in the Western Indian Ocean, which Beijing uh, has now essentially made permanent including by developing logistical support facilities for its navy in Djibouti. China's One Belt, One Road initiative will also involve a, the development of a swathe of maritime infrastructure right across the northern Indian Ocean and, and down the east coast of Africa. As you might expect, India's imperatives and perceptions of its role in the Indian Ocean are quite different. India considers itself as the leading Indian Ocean state and as destined to be the natural leader of the region. In fact, it takes a somewhat proprietorial attitude towards the Indian Ocean and perceives the presence of extra regional naval powers, particularly those of China, as essentially illegitimate. India has long harboured ambitions to become the dominant power of the Indian Ocean in the long term. Though few Indian officials would care to admit, publicly admit it, many in Delhi see the Indian Ocean as more or less India's ocean. India's views on the Indian Ocean are partly defensive. The country's colonial experience uh, is used to justify the exclusion of extra regional powers from the Indian Ocean an approach that um, some analysts label as India's Munro Doctrine, which is an idea that is explicitly modelled after the US Munro Doctrine, where Washington declared supremacy in its uh, hemisphere about uh, more than a century ago and rejected the presence of other extra-regional powers. The idea involves an assertion, at least unofficially, 
that the military presence of outside powers in India's neighbourhood is essentially illegitimate and that neighbouring countries should ultimately rely on India as the predominant security manager of the region and as the security provider to the region. If it's not actually a policy, it is more in the nature of a preferred objective. It reflects an instinctive view among many in India that if the Indian Ocean is not actually India's, in an ideal world, uh, it ought to be. But these aspirations for dominance or leadership in the Indian Ocean also reflect India's broader strategic aspirations. Some Indian uh, strategists draw a, a direct connection between India's maritime ambitions and its aspirations to become a great world power, just as other rising powers through history have seen naval dominance or naval power as a prerequisite to great powerdom. Now, of course, the Sino-Indian relationship in the Indian Ocean is part of a much broader relationship that combines elements of cooperation, coexistence and competition. But the relationship in the Indian Ocean also has its own dynamics. China's relations in the Indian Ocean, as I mentioned, are not generally perceived in New Delhi as being a genuine reflection of China's interests in the region. Rather, many Indian analysts per perceive these regional relationships as being directed against India, either to encircle it or to keep it off balance. China's projection of naval power into the Indian Ocean has become the Indian Navy's principal long-term source of concern. And uh, in a way, this has only uh, reinforced India's aspirations towards a regional leadership role. China's growing presence in the Indian Ocean has also become an important driver in India's relationships with the United States and Australia. New Delhi sees an imperative to work with Washington and Canberra um, to balance or delay the growth of China's naval presence in the Indian Ocean. However, overall, India's options are fairly limited. It disapproves of China's presence in the Indian Ocean, but is still fairly uncertain about how to respond to it. In fact, India is many years away from being the predominant power in the region, if it ever reaches that status, and so uh, it will need to adjust its response to China accordingly. Now, India's claims to special prerogatives in the Indian Ocean and its views on the illegitimacy of China's presence create fertile conditions for competition. Now, this dynamic is exacerbated by another factor and a very important factor, and that is India's desire to maintain China's strategic vulnerability in the Indian Ocean. Despite the claims of some, in reality, China's presence in the Indian Ocean, its naval presence in the Indian Ocean, represents a manageable military threat. Indeed, the Indian Ocean is the one area in which India holds a clear military advantage over China. Unlike other elements of the relationship where India is normally at a disadvantage, the geography of the Indian Ocean gives major advantages to, uh, to India and corresponding disadvantages to China including the need to deploy naval forces through narrow choke points and rely on limited and uncertain logistical support when it arrives. In strategic terms, uh, the Indian Ocean is, represents internal lines for India and external lines for China. Indeed, 
it is very difficult to see China ever being in a, in a position to defend the entirety of its slocks across the Indian Ocean. And remember, it's uh, insufficient just to be able to defend a portion of one's slocks. One has to be able to defend the entirety of one's slocks. Indeed, it is this naval vulnerability that gives the maritime dimension of the relationship really quite special significance. The Indian Navy has a clear strategy of building its capab capabilities near the Indian Ocean choke points, such as the Strait of Malacca, to create an implicit threat of interdiction of Chinese uh, slocks. Indeed, some analysts are sceptical about the threat of a distant blockade to China in the Indian Ocean, but the possibility of that blockade is taken sufficiently seriously um, by both countries to become an important driver of their strategic thinking about the Indian Ocean. Beijing's basic concern is that in the event of a conflict between the two states, India might be tempted to escalate from the land dimension where mm. India uh, may uh, suffer setbacks to the maritime sphere where it could employ its substantial advantages to restrict China's Indian Ocean trade. In Chinese war planning, this is called the 1.5 war scenario, where uh, there is a primary war occurring in East Asia, potentially involving the United States and Japan, and a smaller regional conflict um, uh, breaks out uh, in the Indian Ocean region involving India. So Beijing takes a sharply different view from, China, from New Delhi on India's role in the Indian Ocean and le the legitimacy of China's regional presence. Although Beijing may currently accept US predominance in the Indian Ocean, and indeed it can do little about it, it takes quite a different view to India's aspirations. A starting point of these perceptions, uh, or Chinese perceptions of India's status in the international system, in contrast with India's views on its own destiny uh, to become a world power, Chinese analysts perceive the country as lacking in comprehensive national power and ascribe to it a status that is significantly below other major Asian powers such as Japan and Russia. Indeed, there is a major asymmetry in Chinese and Indian threat perceptions. India tends to regard uh, China as a significant threat whereas China does not regard India in those terms. Chinese perceptions may be changing, if slowly. India's build-up of military capabilities near Southeast Asia um, is attracting attention of Chinese analysts. But it is the uh, US-India relationship that really grabs Beijing's attention particularly the prospects of substantial defence cooperation between them. In fact, uh, I would argue that the India-US defence relationship is one of the only things that makes Beijing sit up and take notice of India. There is also a widespread perception among Chinese analysts that India seeks to establish a sphere of influence or even hegemony in the Indian Ocean and various analyses of the perspectives of Chinese strategic experts show a widespread, if not unanimous, view that, among them that India believes that the Indian Ocean is India's ocean. But at the same time, Beijing strongly suggests any suggestions that India has any ability to restrict China's relationships in the region. And overall, China pays little heed to Indian sensitivities about uh, China's activities. Indeed, few Chinese analysts even appear to have an understanding 
of the depth of Indian sensitivities about China's presence. Some argue that uh, India's neighbours have the perfect right to form economic and security relationships with whichever country they choose. China's uh, links to Pakistan, which as I mentioned earlier, include uh, the proliferation of nuclear weapons and missiles, are brushed off as unimportant because, according to Chinese analysts, they are not directed at India. And Chinese analysts argue that the, uh, a policy of supporting in, uh, Pakistan in order to balance and contain India, if it ever existed, is no longer a feature of Chinese thinking. However, none of this is any reassurance to uh, analysts in Delhi. In fact, China's, I would argue that China's lack of sensitivity towards India and its dealings with India's neighbours is a key driver of the negative dynamic that we are seeing in, in Sino-India relations. And a great example uh, of this occurred in September 2014, when just a few days prior to the planned visit of President Xi to uh, India, and in fact, the first uh, visit by Xi and meeting with um, Prime Minister Modi in, in their capacity as leaders of the countries, of their own countries, a few days before that, a Chinese submarine made an unplanned and unannounced visit to um, Colombo in Sri Lanka. And simultaneously in the north, a battalion of Chinese PLA troops crossed the line of actual control in the Himalayas. Now, it's not clear at what levels these actions were approved, but any analysts with even a passing knowledge of South Asia should have been aware of India's likely reaction. They left New Delhi absolutely furious and had a significant adverse impact on Xi's visit. Among other things, these actions reduced any room that Modi had uh, to agree to China's proposed investment projects in India. So despite waiving billions of dollars in potential investments around in India, uh, Xi went home empty-handed. And really, ultimately, any possibility of a China-India partnership in the short term was left in tatters. Now, to my mind, these events raise real questions about Beijing's strategy towards India. What was Beijing trying to achieve through them? Was it attempting to send a message that China could do as it wished in and around South Asia? And to what extent were there differences in opinion between uh, military and civilian decision makers? Or simply were decision makers, did they simply lack an understanding of Indian sensitivities? Now, some Chinese analysts have begun to concede that China's lack of transparency over its uh, activities in the Indian Ocean, and that includes China's Maritime Silk Road initiative, could be causing unnecessary damage in the relationship. New Delhi claims that Beijing has not adequately uh, responded to requests for clarification about its intentions over the Maritime Silk Road and the One Belt, One Road project leading the Indian Foreign Secretary to comment that when a national initiative is devised with national interest, it is not incumbent on others to buy it. Overall, in my view, there seems to be little chance that India will be a willing partner to China in the Indian Ocean and every chance that it, uh, India will oppose Chinese initiatives throughout the region. We saw this only a few weeks ago when Modi, on uh, India's National Day, sent his greetings to the people of Baluchistan. Now, this greeting was directed at China just as much at Pakistan, knowing that the proposed uh, uh, CPEC, uh, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, would be running through the province of uh, Baluchistan. 
And this has all been driven by uh, Beijing's failure to address India's concerns about these projects. And in part, uh, this has been part of the fuel that has been feeding the fire of the conflict in Kashmir. Now, greater transparency by Beijing and its relationships in the Indian Ocean might stop India from sliding into simple obstructionism over China's uh, projects and engagement in the region. But transparency alone would not address the fundamental differences in perceptions over Indian and China's, uh, India's and China's roles in the region. This would require a much greater effort on both sides to build a mutual understanding and respect of their competing perspectives. In fact, in my view, I think there is a considerable risk that these differing perceptions over uh, status and aspirations and legitimacy could descend into long-term strategic rivalry. China seems intent on pressing ahead with its plans in the Indian Ocean region without making a major effort to co-opt India as a partner. However, China may find it very difficult to find to create a favourable geostrategic environment for itself in the Indian Ocean in opposition to India. Now, all these issues raise major challenges for Australia and every country with interests in the Indian Indo-Pacific. Um, there's much focus on China's assertiveness in the Pacific theatre, most obviously in the South China Sea. But to what extent do these concerns also translate into the Indian Ocean theatre? In the Indian Ocean, is China merely moving to protect its own legitimate interests? And if so, should Australia be working with its uh, major partners, such as the United States and India, to co-opt China as a legitimate stakeholder in the Indian Ocean? Alternatively, one of the many alternatives should Australia be working with our partners to improve defensive capabilities in the Indian Ocean to perhaps more effectively deter assertive Chinese behaviour elsewhere? Uh, these are big questions and I'm not going to uh, seek to answer them today. But um, if, I, if I could ask um, uh, Pramit Pal Chaudhuri to say, uh, spend five or so minutes uh, giving us his thoughts on these questions, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, David mentioned the Monroe Doctrine. Now, one of the things uh, when I studied uh, American diplomatic history when I was a college student in the US, one of the things that we're always reminded of, though, is that the Monroe Doctrine worked uh, because Britain supported it. The original Monroe Doctrine, if I remember, written was actually written by Lord Castlereagh, who sent it to John Quincy Adams, who told, basically told uh, uh, James Monroe, uh, make it an American announcement, and the Britain will automatically support it because a British Navy, not the American Navy, has the capacity to enforce the Monroe Doctrine, but we can pretend it's American. Um, and one of the things I'd like to emphasize, and I think I fully agree with most of what David has mentioned, but I'd just like to put a little perspective to this. While it's important to, yes, the, the Indo-China relationship is basically adversarial, uh, but the Indian side is also fully cognizant that it's partly adversarial because the Chinese doesn't, don't take India very seriously. Um, and <clears throat> this is, uh, I've been a part of a track two dialogue with the Chinese now for four years, and this is very clear that the Chinese really get irritated when people put India and China on the same plane. So this is, this is nonsense. This is like, you know, uh, putting India and Nigeria on the same plane or something. It's really insulting to them. Um, so the, uh, <clears throat> um, I say Nigeria, I lived in Africa 15 years, so I'm quite kind of happy to, to, to tell my, the land of my childhood, uh, give them a little hard time. But the point is that Indians accept this. You talk to them at the highest level, uh, I'm always struck by the fact, they'll always say, well, part of the policy that we have is to eventually try to make China to take 
let China take us seriously. And that's going to take a while. We accept this. Uh, in the meantime, we have to manage the relationship on a whole host of other fronts, of which the primary area is the border dispute uh, and the constant, should I say, uh, engagements between India and the Chinese uh, Chinese soldiers. Now, if you've ever been to the border up there uh, and talked to our soldiers or talked to or been to some of these areas, you realize that the systems are actually very well worked out, that when for the most part there's a very complex system by which the two, uh, the two sides work out. If sometimes the troops cross each other and, and, and so on, it doesn't actually happen to be a, a problem. And the Indian side... Uh, monitors some of this largely to see whether or not China is sending a message uh, at some point or another, and they do the same thing, presumably, for us. Now, having said that, uh, what, else are this, what else does the Indian system think on the China? One of the things, and I go back to the Monroe Doctrine, is that, and this is a very important part of it, a large portion of what India does with China is also driven by how India perceives a larger geopolitical framework globally. And on the Indian Ocean side, and I think it's very important to mention this, so I want to add this to what David is saying, is India's ocean strategy and strategy in other parts of the world is also driven by their relationship with the United States. And one of the key elements that Indian side has been worried about, uh, especially since the uh, Obama administration has come to power, is that America is not very interested uh, in the larger parts of the world. And a lot of the post-World War II consensus that drove American foreign policy, and which we have taken for granted, at least the Indian side definitely has, uh, is now basically falling apart in Washington. Um, and it doesn't matter whether Hillary Clinton comes to power. The fact that a person like Donald Trump has come so close to being coming to power in Washington is a very clear sign for them that at least one half of the political establishment or voting base in America no longer supports that consensus. Um, some of you have probably written, seen Tom Wright's uh, recent article, um, I think it was in The Atlantic, no, um, in Foreign Policy, um, on showing that Trump is effectively a Taftian Republic, a Republican going back to a 19th century isolationist sense of what America should be. Now, Indians have been looking at this for a long time. And for them, Obama was really the beginning of that tradition coming back into play. Whether it was a so-called G2 policy, uh, his re deep reluctance to get involved in any way whatsoever in the Middle East, even if that meant the rise of the Islamic State. But I'll add another thing that's not so well known is, is the Somali pirates. Uh, at one point, the Somali pirates had become such a problem on the Western Indian Ocean that it was beginning to seriously impact the Indian economy. Our coal supplies trade uh, was effectively beginning, it was actually ta taking an impact on our GDP figures. Our then um, non-national security advisor, Shiv Shankar Menon, actually assembled a, na a core of nations, uh, Sri Lanka, for example, um, and some of the African states, uh, and I think even one Arab state, to consider an expeditionary force against the Somali pirates in which Indian soldiers, ground troops would have led the way and the Indian Navy would have led the battle. Uh, the country that opposed it was the United States. The United States said, no, we don't want to get involved in attacking another Muslim country. Forget it. Obama's off. That's off the radar. Um, even if all America was asked to do was provide air support and airlift capacity support, America said nothing doing. Um, for the Indian side, it was just one more bit of evidence that as far as the Indian Ocean was concerned, as was true for other parts of the planet, the Americans were now so deeply reluctant to get involved or commit themselves in any way and even try to seek accommodation with China that India would effectively have to begin to design an Indian Ocean strategy and a larger foreign policy that would have to assume that America would only occasionally be part of the equation. Um, so a lot of what we're seeing on the Indian Ocean side is not just, uh, it fits in, should we say, with a larger, should we, latent Indian aspiration to be a great power in its, in its, in its own area, um, but it fits in also with a deep sense of concern uh, that, uh, we're in, that the country that used to provide the public security goods in the Indian Ocean region, including the Persian Gulf area, uh, let alone the Straits of Malacca and Southeast Asia, simply may or may not be there, um, but we would assume that over time it will be less likely to be there uh, than it is right now. Um, and as a consequence, the one other, and so the other side, flip side to this has been the, the very savage degradation of the relationship between India and Russia. 
Um, in fact, last recently I met the foreign secretary, the Indian foreign secretary, and I asked him, I said, what is your, one of your, I mean, we're beginning to discuss various geopolitical issues, and he said the Russia relationship is now possibly one of the most critical problems we will face over the coming decade. And basically that Russia had become so subservient to Beijing since the Ukraine crisis that India could really no longer factor this Russia increasingly into its own geopolitical equations. Uh, this in turn had other consequences for India in, in various other fields. Um, and the other geopolitical concern that India has now is, as David, I fully agree, there's one belt, one road. Um, and the flagship enterprise within that is the China-Pakistan economic corridor. Uh, the combination of the one belt, one road, and, and you can see this in repeated public speeches on the Indian side now, is that connectivity and infrastructure are now becoming geopolitical concerns for Asia, and definitely for India. And the One Belt, One Road, now the flip side to this, of course, is that having decided that, China having decided that it's going to put a lot of its, it's going to really be Xi Jinping's almost personal prestige project to build the Pakistan Economic Corridor. Now, anybody who knows those parts of the world like Baluchistan uh, or, or Kashmir and the areas of the One Belt, One Road will eventually go into areas that are actually controlled, by, I think, by the Taliban. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see how the Chinese build this because the Pakistanis have not been able to build anything there. Um, <clears throat> and that's the, just, the des best efforts of the Pakistani military. Uh, you talk to the Iranians. Uh, there was an attempt by one pa Indian oil and gas minister who was a big supporter of a pipeline through Pakistan to visit that same area of Balochistan. Uh, he went all the way up to the, to the district area and then the Pakistani army turned him back saying, we can't actually guarantee your security anymore. So the Indian side now has flipped this around to the Chinese and basically begun to say, well, we're having we have a various problems with you. So if you want this corridor to be built and you want our endorsement, which has now become almost a, a constant pattern at the highest level when Xi and Modi meet, she basically says, when are you going to endorse the road and the belt road? And Modi is very clear, I'm not going to endorse the belt road unless we have some other issues to be worked out first. Uh, we're now using that as leverage with China. And it's been remarkably successful, at least as far as the Pakistan side is concerned. Um, so what I just want to put all of this together, what I'm trying to say is simply this, is that... Um, while there's definitely a whole host of areas, as, we, as David has gone into the, the military side, um, the, the border issues, the maritime, the diplomacy, the, the, the struggles for influence with smaller countries like Sri Lanka, Nepal, and in Africa increasingly, uh, between India and China, though often it's important to realize that the US, Japan uh, are our players in all of this as well. Um, at the heart of this is a larger geopolitical Indian concern that has really picked up only in the past 10 years. Uh, and that at the heart of it is that America is no longer a dependable player, uh, that Russia is probably no longer going to be, should not be expected to be on our side uh, over, over, the next, over the next decade. Um, and that it is also, as I mentioned, not completely clear what China wants to accomplish in the Indian Ocean area, because in China itself is not only just not transparent, I would argue China itself, in many times, hasn't worked out exactly what it wants to do, which makes in many ways much more imperative, I think, that countries like India, Australia, Indonesia, and so on, uh, in this region, the, the mid-level powers, if you wish, uh, talk a lot more with each other, uh, both of what they believe the, the two or three bigger players are, are actually planning. And I'll just finally end, one country where is an area that while, you, you, as David has mentioned, that India, the U.S.-India relationship is something that China does pay attention to. The other relationship China pays to now increasingly is the India-Japanese one. Uh, Japan, Japan is not a military power in the Indian Ocean in any sense of the world, but what Japan has come in and said strategically, we don't do military very well. Uh, we can't even sell submarines to Australia. Um, <clears throat> uh, but we have... Um, but we do have other capacities, which is that you don't have a world-class manufacturing sector in your economy. And at the heart of everything, ultimately, is your economy. So we're going to build you one. The Japanese first offered to transfer thousands of their factories out of China because they want to get out of China and move them to India. 
India said, fine, move them, but then India never built the infrastructure to accommodate them. So the Japanese said, all right, we get how this works. We'll build the infrastructure for you. Um, so in effect, if you look at projects like the Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor, the Western Dedicated Freight Corridor, the Chennai-Bangalore Corridor, these are projects on an enormous scale. And this is India, so it'll take a while for them to come up, but they are coming up. Uh, and just the DMIC, the Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor, when you realize what China Japan is trying to do, they're building a 1,400 long, a kilometer long uh, state-of-the-art in um, logistics corridor that is designed to replicate the, the Osaka-Nagoya Industrial Corridor that runs through the Inland Sea and is the heart of Japan's industrial capacity. Replicate that in India, shift as much as 8,000 to 10,000 of its factories out of China, put them all along them and have them become the core of a giant industrial export-oriented manufacturing base that India just simply lacks, and at the top end of the technology cycle. Um, and they want to build four of these corridors. This is just the first one. And they've already started planning for the second and the third. All across the board, the Japanese are basically saying, by the time we're finished, you were very clear. When I go to Japan, the government is very clear. The productivity base, the surges in your service-based economy are now slowly dying out. You lack capacities at the high end, digital manufacturing, which are the core of aerospace defense capacities. You're starting to see that in some sectors of your economy, and you, but you do have one thing. You have enormous software capability, far better than almost any other Asian country. So we just have to merge these to create a genuine economic base from which your military and strategic capacities can then surge. And as David has mentioned, the other country that's come into the picture is the United States and said, we're part of the same game. And what we want to do with you is that the technologies, of the, once Japan gives you those technologies, the IPR stuff that we have, you, that doors start to open for you to pick up whatever you want out of the American basket. When I last met the U.S. ambassador, I concluded this. He, I asked him, I said, in the Indo-U.S. relationship, defense relationship, where are you seeing the greatest progress? He said, it's very clear, the joint working group on carrier technology. Because carriers effectively combine almost every element of the best of what America has, whether it's aerospace, submarine, reconnaissance, satellite, it's all packaged into one giant carrier task force. And he said, your next generation carrier, your present generation are, are basically a lost cause for us. Your next one is a ski jump. It's not really in, in our, uh, our technology sphere. But the generation after that, that's going to be American. And it's going to be the best of what we can because of China. Uh, and, and, our, and what we can do to help you respond to that. But you have to learn how to build them first. And that's where the Japanese come in. I'll just end with that. Pramit, thank you, I think, for those wide-ranging remarks uh, responding, I think, to the way that David Brewster has, I think, very well framed our discussion today. It's, it's good to see, I think, from the outset that there's going to be quite a sophisticated discussion on these issues moving beyond, firstly, I think a very simplistic uh, US-China dynamic as being the only dynamic that matters in the Indo-Pacific. Secondly, identifying that there are overlapping areas of uh, competition and coexistence uh, and the question is really how do we manage this, how do we navigate our way through it while maintaining the interests of uh, the countries in between, maintaining stability and, and mutual respect. I also uh, think it's important to look at this beyond that, uh, again, very simplistic containment lens that we often hear applied to strategies to manage the rise of China uh, in, in the region. It's quite clear that um, there are obviously deep trading interests and other forms of engagement between India and China, but it's also quite clear that uh, China's interests in the Indian Ocean, of course, uh, in many cases there are legitimate interests and China will be a player in the Indian Ocean uh, regardless of what other countries do about it. So I think the policy challenge that I would perhaps put uh, to both of you and maybe to the group as we go through the day is what are the options for a country like Australia uh, in, helping to, in helping to create the context uh, for a Chinese role in the Indian Ocean uh, that is uh, stable, that that is not destabilising and that doesn't, uh, I guess, raise risks of, of, of conflict with India or, uh, or others. So I think the, the areas of common ground that have been identified in, for example, 
building webs of partnership uh, with India, Australia and other countries in the region I think is, is, is particularly fruitful. Um, I also like the characterisation that I think, um, David, you pointed to and both of you pointed to about the so-called One Belt, One Road uh, initiative that China has uh, in the region. I've had, I've had Indian accounts of that put to me that perhaps there should be many belts and many roads. But, uh, but it's interesting that uh, if we look at this Indo-Pacific idea of, um, I guess, the energy and other linkages between the Pacific and the Indian Oceans now being, uh, a, I guess, a, a pretty inevitable uh, aspect of the way we engage with the region, um, Whatever China says regarding the Indo-Pacific idea, clearly the maritime Silk Road, the maritime dimension of China's engagement across the Indian Ocean with infrastructure and partnerships, and I think ultimately a security dimension, uh, is perhaps uh, the Indo-Pacific with, uh, with Chinese characteristics. One thing that neither of you mentioned perhaps in a lot of detail yet but we might come to a bit later in the day uh, is how much will the Indian, Indian Ocean matter in the, the wider strategic competition between India and China. And by that I mean not only the, the point about vulnerability of China's uh, energy lines across the Indian Ocean, but also, for example, the role that submarines and other naval forces are going to play in the wider strategic balance. Uh, the fact that India, for example, is appearing to invest a bit more seriously now in its nuclear armed submarines, its SSBN program, which may or may not provide it with some degree of deterrence against China. The fact that China also is now investing much more heavily in submarines and we're beginning to see Chinese submarines in the Indian Ocean too. So I would, I'd be interested perhaps if either of you came back to that. But look, with those comments um, and just also noting, Pramit, that it's great to see you here because I think uh, having known you and worked with you for I think uh, 15 years or so now, um, certainly one of the voices that really helped me understand India during my diplomatic career. It's great. It's great for you to be introduced to colleagues uh, again here in Canberra and we'll hear from you more this afternoon. But with that I might open to a few questions or comments from around the room for our, for our speakers. Please raise your hand if you have a comment or question. Please. And perhaps uh, identify yourself. Hey, good morning. Well, my name is Commodore Pete Levy. I'm in the Australian Navy. Um, question for you, David. You spoke there a lot about uh, China's maritime activities uh, in the Indian Ocean. We're also seeing the Indian Navy increasingly out in, in, uh, in the South China Sea, for instance, and getting close, stronger relationships with ASEAN. Um, Given your comments about, or both of these comments about how uh, the Chinese don't necessarily take India seriously, um, do you have any comments on how the Chinese view? India's naval activity in the South China Sea uh, and their relationship with Asian nations. Uh. I'll start yeah. and take okay. over. Um, look, I, I, I see India's naval uh, activities in the South China Sea as essentially reactive um, against China rather than reflecting real Indian interests, other than a, a, there is certainly a, a broader interest in freedom of navigation, but in terms of economic interest in that area, they're actually fairly minor. Um, and certainly many people see uh, India's activities in the South China Sea as simply an attempt to play a balancing game against China that, that India can play with Vietnam just as China can play with Pakistan. But frankly, I don't think the Chinese take it seriously at all. Pramit, would you have a different view? Yeah, I would take, I more or less agree. I think the bulk of what India has done in the South beyond the Straits of Malacca has really been at the invitation of ASEAN countries, not because India itself is wildly excited by the South China Sea. Uh, whenever you talk at the highest level, they say that you know, the Indian Ocean is quite big enough and we're still nowhere close to coming close to being able to, to stabilize this area. Um, so we have the odd naval exercise there and so on, but it's noticeable that you know Ashton Carter, the Pentagon chief, um, has been a great enthusiast of the Indo-US relationship and has visited made our defense minister eight times and is now trying to sneak in one more visit uh, before his administration uh, leaves. Um, but when he kept asking India, why don't you join uh, the Americans and patrols in, in the South China Sea, the Indian response is, you can't get Australia, Japan, or your other treaty allies to join you. Why are you even wasting your time asking us? We're not even on, we don't even, we're not even a Pacific littoral state. 
Uh, so if you can't get them to join, then don't come to ask us for anything. And even if you do, frankly, we're still not interested. Um, it's just seen as really beyond the limits of any Indian military capacity to be into it. At best, yes, occasionally we may want to, to irritate uh, the, the Chinese, but we actually find it's much better to irritate them in the Sea of Japan. Um, and so we've been holding more naval exercises largely with Japan and the US, the trilateral, the Malabar exercises, for example, is now in Japan, is now permanently part of that. Uh, and we've now extended them into, I think the last round is actually just off the coast of Okinawa. Uh, we find that much more better. If you really want to irritate the Chinese, uh, that's a much better place to go. <laughs> so you're not, so you're, not, you're not denying that India has an interest in playing a strategic role in the Pacific, it's just that it picks its, it picks its fights carefully. It's really, you know, priority number, 10 or 11 um, uh, on this. It's sort of like saying, does India have a strategic interest in the Atlantic Ocean? Uh, yes, uh, but really very low on, on the horizon. I think the bigger concern when that we'll see a, sh a, a new shift that's developed in the past year uh, is actually West Asia, the Persian Gulf. Uh, we're seeing a lot of concern there as the American Fifth Fleet is now shrinking very rapidly and America's willingness to do anything in the Persian Gulf is now quite negligible, uh, where Despite I think, the first two years of one and a half years of the of the present government in India, Modi had did nothing, uh, did never visited the Middle East, and since then he's very rapidly he's met he's gone to the UAE, Qatar, Iran, Saudi Arabia, um, and the next Republic Day chief guest in India will be the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, uh, the first time we've ever had anybody uh, from the UAE uh, in the past sixty years. Thank you for your presentation. My name is Vibhor. Uh, I'm a master's student uh, at ANU. Uh, so uh, my question is, uh, if you look at the Chinese narrative uh, uh, about India's objection uh, of their presence in the Indian Ocean, they would give you a counter saying that uh, India never objected to US presence in Diago Garcia uh, in the Indian Ocean. So why are they objecting now? to our presence? So would you say uh, from your presentation, Dr. David, can I infer that uh, uh, the strengthening of India-US uh, defense relationship after 2007 and the, uh, and the fact that uh, US actually has a naval presence in the Indian Ocean, that has accelerated uh, the Chinese assertiveness in the Indian Ocean. Before you answer, because we've got a few other comments, I might take a few more and then we'll sure. give you a few to respond to at the end. Um, so I think the gentleman here and then Lee Corder and I'll come to you uh, at the end, Craig, please. Uh, Tom Worthington from the Research School of Computer Science. Uh, earlier in the year, I found myself teaching the students about the ethics of cyber warfare in the South China Sea. So I'd like to ask about the role you see technology playing in the region. If China can um, mass produce robot submarines and aeroplanes at the rate they produce smartphones, and if India can use their clever software developers to program those sorts of devices and produce them in their new high-tech corridor, um, will that make um, American aircraft carriers and submarines patrolling the region a bit like battleships were in World War II? We'll take one more uh, and then we'll answer those and then do one last round. So I think Lee Cordner. And Tom, it's great to see you into cross-disciplinary flavour to the proceedings today. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. I just want to try and draw a connection by two comments that were made by our opening speakers. Um, David talked about the uh, context of status and legitimacy and all this, the business of perception. And I guess the, behind that is, you know, the so what for Australia question. Um, and then um, Pramit talked about the need for much greater middle power engagement with India in the region. Um, and it just seems that um, here in Australia, we seem to be taking China very seriously, but I don't think we're taking India very seriously. I just wonder if you would care to comment on that and the so what of that, and if that, my perception is one that David shares from the Australian side, and, and if um, Pramit shares that perception from the India side, and the so what for what this wider geostrategic situation that we're considering here. Thank you. Thank you. Lee, and I think actually, Craig, we will take yours as the final question of the more for this session because we're going to have to wrap up in about six minutes. So we'll take yours as well and then answer them all together. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you for two 
terrific presentations. Um, I, I'm intrigued by the way that both of you slip between talking about Modi and talking about India. <laughs> and I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit on the extent to which you think the government regime in India under Modi is uh, an, an agent independent of the various other agents that one might regard as shaping foreign policy over time, corporate organizations, public bodies, civil society, the military itself. To, to, to what extent are you talking about a, you know, a, a regime or to what extent are you thinking at a sort of larger temporal horizon about trying to identify an emergent Indian policy? Thanks, and there's four fantastic questions there, and to the extent we can't answer them in the next few minutes, I think we'll come back to those throughout the day. Uh, US, India, technology, the obsolescence or otherwise of aircraft carriers, is Australia going to take India seriously? Although with the turnout here today, I suspect that we're beginning to see a bit of a change on that one. Uh, and finally, is, Mo is Modi India, what are the other players in India on these issues? So please, um, David, we'll go to you first and then to Pramit. Uh, I'll, I'll start with the US. Look, you can choose. <laughs> the, the, the Indians vociferously opposed the US presence in the Indian Ocean for some three decades, yeah. absolutely vociferously, including Diego Garcia. Yeah. They do not do it now because they see China as the greater threat and assume that the Americans will fade away over decades and that it is in India's interest to allow that slow fade to happen slowly into operation with India. Just as India stopped opposing the fade away of the British in the 1950s and 1960s because they realised it was actually in India's interest. Yeah. So I think there's a fairly close parallel. I don't know much about robots, but um, <laughs> I can sure. say that the big technological, I would see the big technological issue is to the extent to which the Chinese can develop anti-access area denial capabilities in mm -hmm. large swathes of the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. That would really be the big challenge for India, although I don't see it happening for quite some time. I think that's so far away from China's capabilities. So what? Uh, for Australia, I would say um, it's a big so what because, uh, and I think Lee and I are in uh, loud agreement, Australia really doesn't have an Indian Ocean strategy. We're watching, we need a strategy and we just don't have one. And that strategy has to involve where we see India, what role do we see for India in 20 years time, and what role we're we seeing for, for China in 20 years' time in the Indian Ocean. And we haven't really worked all those things through. Modi, I agree, we, it's too easy just to say India or Delhi and Modi, etc. I mean, I think the focus of Modi is, is because he is the most dynamic uh, 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 factor in Indian foreign policy that we have seen for a lifetime and his dynamism overrides the many other multiple strands of Indian thinking about foreign policy. So it's a shorthand and perhaps lazy way to address the issue um, to, to focus on him. Pramit. Um, well, I, wouldn't, I think I, I agree, Diego Garcia. I mean, India's overall strategy has always, or desire has always been, that there'll be no great powers in the Indian Ocean other than India. But they also accept that that's, you know, simply that's, a, that's an ideal. So, and, and they get public goods from the Americans. And in fact, now they're irritated or unhappy that the Americans are pulling out of the Indian Ocean a little faster than they'd want them to. Um, the other country I should add that's there is France. Uh, another, that's the only European power that keeps a, a Indian Ocean well, flotilla, I guess. Uh, and, and we do work closely with the French, but we also want them to leave at some point uh, because we don't think they bring anything more, except I guess now we all have some French submarines, right? Um, so we need them for maintenance. Uh, second, uh, on, uh, on uh, robots. Well, it's interesting. You're, you're describing a shift in warfare. Now, it's one of the other... The, there are three countries India buys weapons from. The United States now, uh, we're now the fourth largest buyer of American weapons in the world. Um, Russia, our traditional Russian uh, supplier, but slowly slowly starting to go off the, off, the, uh, off the list. Number three is Israel. And on any year, any given year, one of these three will be number one. 
Now, the Israel relationship is very, very different on the military side. And Israel comes in and says, uh, why are you buying aircraft? Buy drones. Uh, why are you buying uh, this? Worry about cybersecurity. <coughs> Uh, they, are, they are a completely different security paradigm. The Israelis come in at a very high-tech uh, level, and we are their number one customer in the world for weapons. 50% of their entire defense exports goes to India now. And we work very closely with them on a whole host of fronts. We have the world's largest Israeli-made drone fleet, larger than Israel's, in fact. Uh, the Israeli Aircraft Corporation lives off of our stuff. And having recently joined the missile technology control regime, and I think we will formally become a member in December, we will now be able to buy armed drones and a degree of weapon systems that we've never been able to do before. So we ex I think within the Indian system, there's already an acceptance that we're going to have to slowly shift in that direction. But the partner so far has been Israel rather than any, almost any other country, I would add. Um, uh, what was the other question? Does Australia take India seriously and finally oh, for, oh, is, is Modi Rivers. India? Yeah. <laughs> well, I have to admit, you know, before I came here, I went through my, my notebook to see all of the briefings I'd received from foreign secretaries, additional secretaries in the foreign ministry, the national security advisor, I can go on and on, prime minister. The word Australia didn't appear in one of them. Two and a half years, of three years almost of briefings, and I couldn't find a, one single reference to the word Australia. And... When I went back a little further, it got even worse because I noticed that the Americans in their briefings to us didn't mention Australia either. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, there was one reference, I noticed one back row briefing where Kurt Campbell at that point was what, assistant secretary uh, for, or deputy assistant for, uh, for East Asia. And he actually was saying, these, these are the countries you, you need to be working with, friends of America, blah, blah, blah. And at one point, you know, Japan, so on and so forth, and didn't mention Australia. And somebody actually asked, but you haven't mentioned Australia. And he thought about it, and he said, oh, well, don't worry about them. Um, <clears throat> well, part of that is because the assumption Australia is not a problem. Uh, but part of that also is an assumption that if we have Washington on the Indian side, we don't have to worry too much about Canberra. Um, and the countries that you're very interested in, like Indonesia, for example, India has almost no relationship with. I mean, really parlous defense relationship uh, with Indonesia. So there is a problem there. And, and then finally, as David mentioned, we can't seem to find any real Indian Ocean strategy in Canberra. So we've kind of given up on finding one. Um, Modi, I'll give you an anecdote. Uh, my sense is that the real difference, I'll give you an I was on the national, I served on the National Security Advisory Board of the Indian Prime Minister for four years. Three of those are with Manmohan Singh, and one of them is Modi. It's a fixed term. Uh, it's a pro bono position, and it's purely advisory, and I'm sure the government pays absolutely no attention to us. Um, but what was striking for me, it's under the Official Secrets Act, so I can't go into detail, but there was an anecdote that I will say so without any. We worked on a national security document for the Manmohan Singh government, and then he fell from power, and then Modi came in. We told the, then the new national security advisor, he said, we have this document, but the terms of reference were set by the previous government, so you may not want to bother with this anymore. He said, it doesn't matter, go ahead and make a presentation to Prime Minister anyway. So we did, we spoke to Modi, we gave him a 90 minute presentation, and the then convener of the board, uh, Mr. Sar Shamsar, and our former foreign secretary, said exactly this to the Prime Minister, the terms of reference have been set by your predecessor, so you may not agree with, almost, with some of what we're talking about. And Modi's response to us basically, I have read the notes all the notes that my predecessor left on national security. I don't have any problems with any of them. My only problem with him is that he didn't implement most of them. And that is the core difference between Modi and I would say most Indian governments uh, in recent history, is that Modi is very focused on implementation. That I am about getting things done the ideas and the, are all there. We have mountains of white papers and commission reports and advisory, I guess every, all governments do, uh, lying there. So we all know what the problems are. My job is to get things th done. And I don't have to, and very, I don't have to, I mean, said in Hindi, it's a Hindi phrase, but it means basically I don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. It's just pointless. Uh, and that's the real shift, I think. And the second big difference Modi has from previous prime ministers, and that is a shift with a, a longer Indian diplomatic tradition. He gets irritated as to why we don't say what we actually believe. And he's actually had pulled up diplomats who said, you know, this is what we want to happen. 
But this is the official line we've had because since, you know, since the 1960s, this has been the way India talks about it. And Modi says, if that's actually what we want to do, then why did we just say it? And they'll say, well, that's not, you know, we, we're always being cautious. He says, we're a $2 trillion economy. Don't give me nonsense. Go off and say it. Um, and so he's now much blunter in saying uh, what he thinks India should do and pulling up the Indian, and he's been shaking up the Indian system. Come out and say you're not happy with this country's policies. Uh, he's the first Indian prime minister to not go to the non-aligned movement. Why? Because he actually thinks it's a waste of time. Uh, we've known this within the system for the past 20 years, it's a waste of time. But in the Indian prime minister, we can't say that that's not the tradition of Indian policy. Now he's saying, yes, it is a waste of time. Um, uh, so, so that's the shift I see really with him, is that he's now expressing things that we've always believed. Um, and as I said, he's very problem, he's driven as a problem solver. It's one of the things why Americans like him so much is that he's really about just getting it. Let's get it done. Um, Obama, and another, Obama met him at the East Asia Summit in Myanmar, and he turned to Modi in front of the other EAS leaders, and he said, now here's the only guy among us who could actually get things done. Um, and Modi's response was, well, I haven't got a Republic Day guest. This was November, and the Republic Day was two months away in January for India yet. And turned to Obama and said, why don't you come? And Obama looked at him and said, all right, OK. I like this guy. This is a quick, that was a quick decision. Let's go. And my, both my Indian and American friends were diplomats, so the blood drained from their face. <laughs> and they realized they were now going to have to put a summit together in two months. And as my American friend said, Christmas and New Year's. Yeah. From it, I'm going to cut you off there because you you will have some more strategic stories for us this afternoon, I suspect. But I think you've had a foretaste uh, of what to expect. Um, look, I want to thank you all for your attention for this first session, um, and I want to um, ask you to join me uh, in thanking our two presenters for their very uh, insightful framing and provocative remarks. Thank you.